Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, let me extend my welcome to all the attendees, uh, WTO members and WTO observers and external participants. A warm welcome to the launch of the World Trade Report 2021. This year's report focuses on economic resilience and trade. The program of today's launch will be as follows. The Director General of the WTO, Dr. Ngozi Onkonjo Iwiala, will share her opening remarks to be followed by a brief overview of the report by the report coordinators, Jose Antonio Montero and Mr. Eddie Beckers. At the end of the presentation, I will moderate a virtual panel discussion with very distinguished and high level speakers, which I will introduce at that time. During today's proceedings, I would like I would call on members and other participants, including journalists attending the launch remotely to submit your questions in the Q&A chat box of Zoom. After the panel discussion, we will do our best to answer the questions posed on the report itself. Um, without further delay, please welcome uh, Director General Ngozi Onkonjo Iwiala for her the opening remarks. Ngozi, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, thank you, Bob. Um... And uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, everyone. Um, it's uh, really exciting uh, to be here, the launch of this uh, World Trade uh, Report. Uh, every year, WTO economists and statisticians, together with colleagues in other parts of the Secretariat, put together a flagship publication, which offers detailed analysis of a trade-related topic chosen for its high policy relevance. I'm really delighted to present to you this year's World Trade Report. It could not be more topical. The report reviews the role of trade, trade policy, and international cooperation in building economic resilience in the face of natural and man-made disasters, from the COVID-19 pandemic to climate change. <clears throat> Policymakers around the world are grappling with questions of how best to reduce risks and make economies more resilient to shocks. They will find many useful insights in the World Trade Report 2021. The report is a team effort, but I'd like to congratulate its two coordinators, Jose Antonio Montero and Eddie Beckers, um, as well as our chief economist, Bob Cookman, and the whole Economic Research and Statistics Division. The lead authors will be presenting the report's key findings in more detail, but uh, I, I would like to share three of the report's key messages with you. First, the hyper-connected global economy has made us more vulnerable to shocks, but also more resilient to shocks when they do strike. <laughs> Consider COVID-19, deep interconnections of trade, finance, and travel allow the virus and its associated economic shocks to spread around the world within weeks. Yet, globalization was also at the heart of why this virus was met with safe and effective vaccines in record time, and now therapeutics. Scientists around the world shared ideas, data, technology. Cross-border supply chains came together to provide the specialized inputs and capital goods needed for large-scale vaccine production. Of course, access to COVID-19 vaccines remains highly inequitable, a subject on which I've commented many times. Of the 7.3 billion doses administered as of last week, only 0.6% had gone to people in low-income countries, where nearly a tenth of the world population lives, and 2.8% to Africa, home to 17% of humanity. Unequal access to vaccines is a major factor in the K-shaped recovery we are seeing in the global economy, in which many developing and least developed countries are being left behind. Vaccine inequity also makes the recovery fragile with the threat of new variants looming. History reminds us that devastating diseases don't need airplanes. They can cross the world at the speed of ships or even horses. But we needed the internet, air freight, and supply chains to invent and start deploying vaccines within the space of a year. The right response to COVID-19 is not to turn the clock back on the movement of goods, services, and people. It is to use the full power of trade 
to accelerate the vaccine production and distribution we need to end this pandemic. The second key message is that policies that aim to increase economic re resilience by unwinding trade integration and promoting self-sufficiency can backfire, effectively reducing economic resilience. While national supply chains can reduce exposure, exposure to international shocks, they can make economies more vulnerable to domestic shocks like crop failure caused by drought or extreme weather events that shut down factories. The ability to import is an important resilience mechanism for economies to cope with localized shocks or shortages. This is part of the reason increased trade integration has been associated with decreased macroeconomic volatility. We have seen this in practice during the pandemic. Leading COVID-19 vaccines are produced in supply chains that cut across as many as 19 countries. Purely national supply chains would almost certainly have delivered far fewer vaccines to the detriment of everyone. Trade helped countries meet skyrocketing demand for medical products in 2020. Even as the value of global trade declined by 7.6%, trade in medical supplies grew by 16%, and for textile face masks by 480%. Closing markets would have left all countries worse off. Many countries depend on imports for medical supplies, and even the most sophisticated economies are not self-reliant. In other words, if you think closing yourself off to international markets is a path to resilience, think again. A more pro promising route to resilience comes from deeper and more diversified markets, suppliers, and transport routes complemented where necessary by strategic stockpiles and other preparedness measures. Ongoing negotiations at the WTO on services, investment, electronic commerce, and micro, small, and medium enterprises could help bring new firms into global trade, making economies more resilient. The third key message is that strengthening economic resilience will require more global cooperation. Global policy cooperation has an important role to play in fostering economic resilience. To take another example from the pandemic, the WTO has been able to enhance transparency about international market conditions by monitoring COVID-related trade measures. We have worked with vaccine manufacturers and other stakeholders to identify supply chain bottlenecks. These efforts have yielded granular information about key vaccine inputs and trade and regulatory barriers that show governments how they can accelerate the cross-border movement of inputs and vaccines. The WTO has been able to use its convening power to push for more vaccine manufacturing in, the, in developing countries. Looking ahead, the low carbon transition will demand trillions of dollars in investment each year. Avoiding supply chain bottlenecks and enabling key inputs and materials to move around the world would encourage investment and prom promote the diffusion of green technologies. In sum, the road to resilience runs through stronger international cooperation, not a retreat into isolationism and protectionism. The WTO's upcoming 12th ministerial conference is an opportune moment for members to come together and use trade to build more resilient economies for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ngozi, and I very much appreciate you taking the time to join us for these remarks and your strong support for research. I also know you have a very strong personal interest in vaccine supply chains and recent developments in logistics, uh, logistics and transportation, and I know you'll continue to support and pay attention to these uh, research efforts going forward. I understand you may have to leave, so... Um, you, you are welcome to leave the podium at any time. And now we'll move on to our next uh, part of the um, presentation of the report. And that will be uh, Jose Antonio Montero and Eddie Beckers presenting um, uh, an overview of the report. Jose Antonio and Eddie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, DG. Greetings, everyone. 
So the World Trade Report 2021 looks at the role of trade, trade policy and international cooperation in economic resilience by addressing three main questions that are interrelated. And the first question is why economic resilience matters. And the report looks at uh, what type of trade, what type of risks and shocks economies face today, now, but also in the future, and how these risks and shocks affect the economy and international trade. The report also looks at how firms, households, and governments respond to these shocks, including in the context of economic resilience. The third, uh, the second question, sorry, looks at uh, the role of trade in economic resilience and uh, analyze how trade can increase risk and in some cases spread shocks, but also support economic resilience. And the last question looks at the role of international cooperation in economic resilience and looks at the, how the WTO and other types of international cooperation forms can support and build economic resilience. As the DG mentioned, the World Trade Report is a collective effort uh, prepared by the Economic Research and Statistics Division, but in collaboration with other divisions in the WTO. The report also benefited from external contribution from experts, from academia, universities, and uh, think tanks who share their views on specific issues um, that relates to economic resilience. We also benefited from um, contribution from university professors from the WTO chair programs from Tunisia, Mauritius, and Kenya. And so we are grateful for their external contribution. And so turning to the first uh, question of the report, why does economic resilience matter? The uh, report notes that economies are increasingly facing a broad range of risks and shocks. So we note, for instance, that natural disasters have been increasing over the, over the years, not only in terms of frequency, but also in terms of intensity, scale, and duration, and they are likely to increase in the future. Uh, other types of shocks of risks, uh, like technological and operational risks, have been decreasing. This is the case, for instance, of uh, transport accidents in part due to uh, safety requirements and uh, innovation, but other types of uh, technological risks such as cyber attacks have been increasing and are likely to continue increasing. Uh, similarly, the rising of inequalities, growing uh, political tensions and geopolitical tensions increases the risk, uh, socioeconomic risk. And so these different types of risks can, in some cases, materialize uh, into shocks. And the report notes that shocks or have, uh, can create and can cause significant damages and destruction, not only in human lives and ecosystems, but also in the economy. And the impact of shocks in the economy can take different, uh, different forms it can impact the demand, the supply, or the level of uncertainty. Importantly, uh, the report notes that international trade can also be impacted by, by shocks. And shocks can impact trade in, through different mechanisms, through different channels. It can impact trade costs, usually increasing trade costs. It can also impact the demand and the supply of exports and imports. Ultimately, the, the, the report notes that the, the impact of shocks on trade remains heterogeneous and depend on a number of factors, including, for instance, the type of, uh, type of shocks. For instance, if you compare the 2008 global financial crisis with the current COVID pandemic, which both are global shocks, they have impacted trade uh, differently. The financial crisis, had a severe impact on uh, merchandise trade and a re relatively limited impact on services trade, 
Conversely, the pandemic had a severe impact on services trade, in particular services requiring face-to-face -face interaction. And as a consequences of lockdown and travel restriction have uh, had a negative impact on, on this type of uh, services. And what we observe is that um, although initially merchandise trade was um, affected, there was a contraction, it uh, quickly uh, bounced back and uh, recovered faster during the pandemic than during the global financial crisis. And uh, this is also the case of digitally uh, enabled services. And so the impact of shocks on trade depend also on the uh, type of sectors. Some sectors tend to be more vulnerable to, uh, to shocks. For instance, um, uh, natural disasters tend to be um, to have a more stronger impact on trade in agricultural products and in services such as tourism. Trade in time-sensitive product is also more exposed to shocks affecting uh, transport infrastructure and logistics, as we saw recently with the, um, the recent blockade in the Suez Canal. The impact of shocks on trade also depends on the initial conditions before the shock hits. Uh, what we observe, for instance, is that the trade of countries with limited financial resources, in particular least developed countries, tend to be more adversely affected by shocks, not only in terms of duration, but also in terms of intensity. And this is in large part due to the fact that those countries have limited diversification. Lastly, uh, the impact of shocks on trade also depends on the public policy adopted by governments in responses to shocks. And so depending on the type of shocks and the channel through which they impact the economy and trade, different types of policies uh, can be adopted from uh, fiscal and monetary policy to energy infrastructure, environmental health uh, measures. And the report notes that Trade policy is also part of the toolbooks, toolbox sorry, of uh, public policy responses to shocks. And in fact, the, the reports note that although there are uh, some government might have an incentive to adopt protectionist measure in response to shocks, in reality, uh, the trade policy response to shock is never fully trade restrictive and never fully trade uh, opening. In reality, it's a combination of both trade restrictive and trade opening measures. And in fact, this is what we observed during the pandemic. Although trade restrictive measures, in particular export uh, restriction on essential goods, attracted a lot of attention, most of the COVID uh, related measures adopted by governments were trade promoting measures. And in addition, many trade restrictive measures, uh, COVID related measures have been uh, removed relatively quickly uh, as the pandemic uh, continued. And, and so in light of this, in light of the fact that there is an increasing um, risk of increasing, the shocks uh, are increasing in frequency and intensity and the prospect of uh, greater risks and greater shocks for the future has led many uh, governments and companies uh, to consider economic resilience as a, as a key objective, as a key strategy. However, there is no consensus on, what, on the definition of uh, what is economic resilience. And so for this report, economic resilience is defined as a, as a process to which different types of strategies and actions can be adopted before the shock hits, during the shocks occur, and after the shock uh, strikes. And so if you look at the, the economic resilience before the shock hits, it's really about preparing for the shocks. And so it's really about managing risks, reducing risks, and if possible, avoiding risks. Once the shock hits, economic resilience is focused on how to cope with the shock, how to um, 
minimize economic disruption by allocating the available resources, usually scarce resources, to continue producing, delivering, and uh, consuming uh, the goods and services. And once the, the shock is gone or is under control, economic resilience is focused on recovering, recovering as quickly as possible from the consequences of the shock. And this typically involves allocating and using available resources to increase productive capacity and investment to support, repair, reconstruct, and uh, in some cases to adapt, to reduce risks and to be better prepared for the, for the future. And as uh, my colleague Eddie will uh, discuss, given the broad dimension of economic resilience, many uh, actions and strategy can be adopted to support and build economic resilience and many of them actually have a trade uh, dimension. Thanks, Jose. Uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, thanks, uh, DG. Um, so I will speak about the role of trade in economic resilience. And we observe that there are two sides. On the one hand, uh, trade can contribute to the spread of shocks. We observe and we, we acknowledge that this is, uh, this is the case. Uh, there are multiple ways in which trade can, can uh, contribute um, to the spread of shocks. So we see, for example, with pandemics, um, um, pandemics can sp spread through, through travel, transport, through the, the trade in, in live animals. However, we also observe there um, that permanent restrictions do not seem to be a, a good answer uh, to limit um, to limit pandemics because their costs are excessive. And the same holds with trade in live animals. Um, what, uh, what, what we tend to find is that uh, it is especially illicit trade and illicit trade in wildlife that is creating most problems when it comes to the spread of pandemics. Then there is a second um, reason why trade could lead to the spread of, uh, of shocks or actually why trade can be a source of shocks. And that is that uh, trade costs themselves can be subject to shocks. So that is what we currently also see with trade costs rising because of transport costs, uh, because of disruptions in, in value chains, and very relevant for the WTO also. If there is uncertainty about trade policy, then trade policy itself can become a source of shocks. So therefore, it's crucial um, that the WTO is there and that it guarantees a stable and, and predictable trade policy. Uh, so that trade itself does not become a source of shocks. Then um, third, when we look at climate change, obviously there is a link from, um, from climate change to shocks, such as uh, wildfires and natural, uh, natural disasters. And so the question is, what role does trade play in, uh, um, uh, what role does trade play in, uh, in climate change? And there, of course, we recognize that trade can, Trade will lead to a larger scale of production, will lead to more transport. So that would raise, that will raise emissions. But on the other hand, also trade can contribute to the diffusion of green technologies and trade can actually help countries to adapt to the shocks that happen when climate change is happening. So if you get negatively affected in, in your agricultural sector and your club, the productivity of your crops declined. And if you can trade and if you can import uh, actually, food you can help to to soften the impact of of this uh, of this uh, climate change shock. Yeah, the the report discusses uh, some other reasons, but these are the most important ones why trade could contribute to the spread of shocks. But then there is also another side of the story, and that is that trade actually can also help countries to cope with shocks, to prepare for shocks, cope with shocks, and recover from shocks. So when it comes to the preparation, we first observe that trade. Um, uh, helps countries to expand their resources because in the long run it will lead to uh, to more economic growth to uh, to larger so that means that countries have more resources available to be prepared then more specifically uh, countries uh, when there are when there is trade they can also benefit from um, the availability of all kinds of services that help countries to be well prepared when there are shocks so you can think of weather services telecommunications uh, insurance markets, uh, logistics, for example. 
Then when a shock uh, is actually hitting, the question is, does trade help you to cope with the shock? And there our answer is also a, a clear yes. And we actually, we've seen that during the pandemic. So trade has helped countries to import at a relatively or at a really fast pace to import goods that were essential to cope with the crisis. And moving from short run to long run perspective, trade also helps countries to, um, or actually it helps the, the, the world uh, to develop products that we need to respond to a crisis. So think of the specialization and knowledge spillovers uh, that we see in, in, um, in the production of vaccines. Then finally, trade also plays a positive role in the recovery from shocks. Um, and here, uh, the, 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 um, the main argument or the main channel is that um, if, you, if you're hit with a domestic recession, so this is not so much related to something that is global like a pandemic, but if a country is hit by a domestic shock, then if you're open to trade, it means that your production can be sustained because you're still going to have demand from abroad. And on the production side, actually, you will be able to continue importing all kind of uh, necessary intermediates. And we actually see that this seems to have played a positive role during the, the COVID pandemic. So what we see in the figure is the share of trade with countries with a relatively low number of COVID cases and the GDP growth during in, in 2020. And so we see that countries that tended to trade more with regions with low COVID cases, they were not so negatively affected by the COVID pandemic. Yeah, so this shows that trade can act as a cushion when you're hit by, when you're hit by a shock. Then the story actually, um, when we trade off this, uh, when we try to balance this, this spreading effect of trade, which is negative and the, the coping, uh, and, uh, and the recovery effect, which is positive, where we try to trade them off. What, what do the, the data tell us then? There is not so much research on this, but uh, there is some very powerful, there are some very powerful insights from the literature that tell, that tell us that uh, on net, it seems to be the case that when countries open up to trade, that um, actually their macroeconomic volatility is falling. Now, of course, this is not telling everything about shocks. There are all kinds of other ways in which you can be affected by shocks, say, when it comes to, to climate change. But when we look at the macroeconomic picture, so volatility in, in GDP, we tend to find clearly that uh, the incre an increase in trade openness for most countries has contributed to a, a reduction in their, in their volatility. There is, though there is one important issue, or um, actually... Um, the, the most important explanation for why this is the case is that uh, trade helps countries to diversify their, uh, their risks. Yeah, because you're not only affected by domestic shocks, but you can actually uh, diversify abroad. Yeah, but this also implies that when you look abroad and when you open up to trade, it's actually also important that you have multiple trading partners and that you export multiple products and that you're not dependent on only a couple of products. Yeah, so therefore, we also find that diversification is associated with reduced volatility. And here, unfortunately, when we look at the data, we see that um, although some countries have a well-diversified di trading pattern, especially higher income countries, for many countries, diversification is still relatively low. Yeah, and so these are the figures that we have here. So we see here that countries that tend to have a higher diversification, they also tend to have a lower volatility as measured by their, by their swings in, uh, in GDP. And finally, here we see that uh, diversification over time uh, on the horizontal axis, we, get diverse, we have diversification in 2003. Then we look at how has it developed when we go to 2018. Most of the, 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 the country combinations are above the 45 degree line. So diversification has increased somewhat but it's still far from enough. So then I, I hand over back to Jose, who will talk about uh, international cooperation. Thank you, Eddie. In fact, turning to the last question of the, the report, what is the role of international cooperation in economic resilience? The uh, report notes that uh, more international cooperation backed by strong, uh, international trade rules can support all the different domestic strategies adopted by governments to build and support economic resilience. And in fact, international cooperation is, is important when talking about uh, economic resilience, 
because many in our economy, which is highly interconnected, many unilateral measures adopted by governments to build and support economic resilience can generate cross-border spillovers. Some uh, measures, some policies to build economic resilience in one country may reduce risk in other countries. However, in the absence of global coordination, the level of risk reduction is likely to be less than optimal from a global perspective. In other words, lower risks might be achieved through cooperation. International cooperation can also reduce the use of policy and measures, unilateral policy and measures that have negative spillovers, such as uh, export restriction on, on essential goods, which in the end can undermine global economic resilience by increasing the risk of retaliation and increasing economic and welfare losses. And so international cooperation and trade cooperation have a key role to play in building and supporting economic resilience. For instance, uh, trade cooperation can uh, support economic resilience by promoting the diversification, as Eddie mentioned, of products, suppliers, and market destinations by helping markets to remain and be open, and also by uh, making trade more uh, inclusive, more predictable, and more stable. Trade cooperation can also um, promote greater transparency and information sharing, which can help governments to better assess capacity productions, identify, identify sorry, bottlenecks, um, prevent uh, um, excessive stockpiling of key uh, products, critical products. And so trade, international trade cooperation can uh, play an important role and of course, given the broad spectrum of risks and shocks, international cooperation on economic resilience involves a broad range of actors at the regional, plurilateral, and multilateral level. And for instance, the report notes that an increasing number of regional trade agreements include provisions that explicitly address natural disaster. And so you find some agreements that include provisions on cooperation on natural disaster management, provisions that lay out some exemption in the event of a natural disaster, or in some cases, provisions that compel the parties to adopt specific risk management um, measures. Although in the WTO agreements, you cannot find the word resilience, the WTO framework supports the condition underpinning economic resilience by maximizing the use of policies that generate and expand uh, positive spillovers and by limiting the use of measures and policies that uh, generate negative uh, spillovers. And some of the main contribution of the WTO to trade cooperation uh, to make the economy stronger and more resilient include the reduction in trade barriers, streamline uh, custom procedures, promotion and support of more transparency and predictability of trade policy, delivering capacity building in trade capacity in poorer country and collaborating with uh, international and regional organization. However, and to conclude, the report notes that although the WTO already contributes to economic resilience, it could contribute even further in a number of areas. It could, for instance, enhance transparency of uh, trade policy further to make sure that the decision-making processes have access to timely uh, information it can also, for instance, clarify the appropriate use of export restriction on critical products to reduce political policy uncertainty and uh, risks in GVCs. Other uh, potential uh, areas of, um, that could contribute to economic resilience include a greater coordination of public procurement of essential goods and services, but also as the DG mentioned, advancing 
ongoing work on e-commerce and uh, micro and small and medium sized enterprises, but also women economic empowerment. And finally, of course, strengthening the existing collaboration between the WTO and other regional and international organizations to promote coherence and mutual, mutual supportiveness between all the different initiatives to build and support economic resilience. Thank you for your time and your attention. Eddie and I remain available for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Okay, that time it worked. Uh, congratulations. Thank you for the overview of the report um, and all for all the hard work that you put into it. Um, it's, uh, it was quite an endeavor uh, and under difficult circumstances given all the challenges around uh, COVID-19. So I'd like to thank you guys uh, for this uh, excellent work and also the, the support that we received from uh, the Secretariat of the WTO um, and the outside um, contributors. That was, uh, I think, uh, an excellent contribution to the report. So now I would like to turn to our distinguished panel, um, where we're going to have speakers, uh, Mami Misutori, Stormy Annika Mildner, and Lars Michael Jensen. We'll start with Stormy. Um, and I'll uh, introduce you more fully when I uh, when you make your interventions. So let me start with uh, Storm, Dr. Stormy Mildner. Um, if you could share your insights on the role of trade and economic resilience. You're currently executive director of the Aspen Institute in Germany, in Berlin. Uh, you were, or maybe still are, a member of the G7, G7 panel on economic resilience, which put out an excellent report uh, just a little over a month ago. Um, and you also teach at the Hurdy School, classes on political economy. And um, my previous uh, interaction with you was uh, during the German G20 presidency when you uh, represented the Federation of German Industries in the B20, and you were in charge of international trade and investment topics. Um, uh, Stormy, the floor is yours. Thank you so very, very much uh, for the invitation, as well as for the very kind words. Um, I would have loved to be in Geneva and see you in person, um, but I think with the current circumstances, we just have to do what we have to do. Um, I have to say the report um, comes extremely timely, and I'm very impressed um, by its analytical rigor um, and all the research which went into it. Um, and um, I want to underline this because over the last year, we have worked uh, intensely in the G7 and the resilience panel on resilience issues, but this uh, report is impeccable and um, has a lot of new ideas in there, which I appreciated a lot and reading, reading a lot. Um, I think the COVID crisis, which we have still not overcome, has shown us very, very much where we have vulnerabilities and where we have strengths. And the report um, outlines that very clearly. We are confronted with several crises at the same time, not just the pandemic, but the climate crisis, the environmental crisis, a migration crisis, security crisis, geopolitics crisis. And that makes management so very, very um, hard. And many of these crises and also the risks which the report uh, identifies amplify each other and cause unprecedented new threats. Um, and that is a big challenge for risk uh, management. I very much appreciated in the report um, how clear you, you laid out um, the different kind of risks, um, that some are exogenous, some are en uh, endogenous, um, some are well-known, some are not so well-known, some are unknown, some are natural, some are technological, and some are socioeconomic. And you um, lined out very clearly which ones are increasing and which ones might also be decreasing. Um, we just heard that around the world, everybody is talking about resilience. And this is not a new concept. And we have talked about it a lot in the past, pretty much ever, after every single big crisis which we faced. Um, 
Unfortunately, we also seem to forget pretty quickly. And thus I found one sentence in the report, which I really would like to underline. And that is the biggest risk we are currently facing is political failure. It is the failure to make our economies more resilient um, and to make our societies more resilient. And what do I mean when I talk about resilience? Um, I mean, um, preparedness, so the ability to identify a risk and to prepare for it. Recoverability, the ability to quickly react um, to a crisis and to recover from a crisis. Flexibility and adaptability, so the ability to adapt to a crisis. And the last one that I find most important, and that's what I would call transformability. So our ability to transform and thus reduce vulnerabilities for the future. And I think this is where we are really not that good at. And that's where we have to put a lot more effort into it. Um, I very much um, agree with the lessons learned um, you identified um, in the report. And I would just like to pick out the five ones uh, very briefly, um, which, um, which I would like to highlight. And that's the, the first one is that um, although we have gone through a lot of crises in the past, our impulses first and foremost are national and self-interested. So Germany, for example, my home country, um, enacted very early on in the crisis export barriers um, for medical equipment. Um, then the EU did it. Many other countries followed uh, suit. And this did not help uh, manage the crisis. Quite the contrary, it exacerbated uh, the crisis. That's not the way to go. So I very much agree, instead of less international cooperation, we need more international cooperation and on all levels, between businesses, between civil society, between governments, between international um, organizations. And we need more solidarity um, on all levels. The second takeaway, from the, from the crisis and the report for me, is um, on global and regional value chains, um, that they held up pretty well um, in the crisis, better than some of us expected, but um, that there are um, lots of risks in there and vulnerabilities, and we have seen that currently with the bottlenecks um, and um, with problems in the supply chains for, for semiconductors, for example. And this is something we have to address. And the answer to this is not reforming. Um, the answer to this is not um, promote self-sufficiency. The answer, as the report um, outlines and we just heard, is um, uh, to rethink just-in-time deliveries, to build redundancies, and to diversify. Um, that is the answer, and not, not going backwards um, in, in time. The third one is um, that the crisis risks to cement long observed global and national imbalances. Um, the most vulnerable were at most within countries, um, but also between countries. We heard that um, inequalities and poverty have uh, risen in several countries, um, that inequalities um, have increased, small medium enterprises were particularly hit hard and small, smaller poorer countries were hit hard because they didn't have the resources um, to buffer the crisis. So what we need to do is more investment in SDGs, um, in digital inclusion, um, we have to get rid of tax evasion, um, we have to integrate um, smaller, poorer countries more fully in global markets. But we also have to take a look, an honest look at our social systems um, within our countries um, and look at those who are more, most vulnerable most. The fourth takeaway is that um, if we didn't have the WTO now, um, we definitely would need it. Um, and um, we, I, I'm pretty sure that we would have seen a lot more protectionism without it. But at the same time, we have to invest in better rules, better monitoring, and um, also a dispute settlement uh, procedure which works so that the WTO can also in the future ensure the power of the rule um, instead of um, the power of the powerful, so to say. And I think that MC12 um, is vital for this. It's vital to show solidarity, but it's also vital to adapt the WTO. And it would be, I think, a big, big problem for building resilience um, if MC12 failed. Um, and uh, my last point is, um, and that brings me back to my, my previous role, um, we will not build resilience um, without the business sector. So the business sector needs to be integrated in our, in our uh, thinking talks um, about building resilience. Um, of course, those are the ones who are structuring their value chains. And I think that the WTO has 
um, moved forward a lot um, with the business dialogues, with the exchange with the business community to get the, the expertise in there. But also the business community needs to understand more what kind of risks we are facing and how they are interacting. So let me conclude by just uh, congratulating you on the report again. Um, I hope that it will be picked up uh, by the members and will have a lot of um, policy relevance moving forward. I thought it was a really, really interesting read. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stormy. Uh, your perspective, particularly coming from that business background is, is very helpful. Uh, but you also made a, a call for um, a broad discussion across business governments and civil society. Uh, the problems have multiple dimensions and need multiple actors to try to help solve them. Uh, so thank you, but we'll come back to you in the Q&A. Um, our next speaker will be Lars Michael Jensen. Uh, who will share his insights on how logistics and supply chain management can help support a more proactive and sustainable response to future shocks. Lars Michael is currently Senior Vice President and Head of Global Ocean Network at Maersk. He is leading the team responsible for the optimization of the ocean network design and individual market strategy in the Trans-Pacific, Asia, Europe, and Transatlantic markets. Um, he's very busy these days, and we appreciate him taking his time to uh, share his perspective with us. Lars Michael, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Robert. Thanks for having me. Um, I think a lot of what I've heard over the last 45 minutes uh, resonates well with um, what I was going to speak to. And uh, it links into the, I want to say, the role of the logistics, international logistics in trade. And it's essentially uh, two sides uh, to the same coin, trade and logistics. Um, we have, as been referred to currently, a bit of a, a crisis, a, a shock, you could say, that's kicked off by the pandemic, and then also an exceptionally strong uh, growth in consumer goods uh, into the U.S. especially. Um, so we've been challenged, uh, and uh, the thing to remember in all of this here is that actually, despite all the headlines and what happens when a ship goes across in the Suez Canal and so on, international trade and transportation did actually continue. We were concerned at some point in time, you can say in the second quarter of 19, oh sorry, in the second quarter of 20, that the whole thing would collapse, that ports would basically come to a meltdown, ships would not sail or anything. It didn't happen. Trade actually uh, uh, continued. But I think it was a reminder to, to all of us of how, I to say, efficient everything else equal that global supply chain has been and what role it has played in actually promoting the uh, international trades. There's been very little waste. And then when shocks, smaller shocks are happening, it can be absorbed, absorbed. But when big shocks like the pandemic happened, it wasn't able to, and it was basically one thing uh, after the other. Uh, no one is at fault as such, but uh, it is just that you can say the, the challenges, they, they, they came, they came one by one and then added it all together. It really showed that, uh, I would say the lack of resilience, you could say, in that international uh, logistics chain. But the thing to remember is, is also that, at least in container transportation, we today actually move more containers around the world than ever. So it's not like the world has come to a standstill because we can't get the pair of shoes that we were actually looking for when we went down to the store to get it. So... I want to speak a little bit to what we have learned seen from a business perspective. And I really appreciate and agree with Stormy that business and the, you can say the authorities in, in this go hand in hand to, to, to solve this. And um, uh, it is a lot about risk management uh, indeed. And it is preparing for the, uh, for the next shock. What we've seen from our customers when we deal with them, that it's a lot about building in flexibility in the supply chain. There's been lots of talks for many years and lots of uh, examples of, uh, of just-in-time principle. And that has worked. But what the current 12 months have shown or the latest 12 months have shown it is that when there is some kind of hiccups in that, it may not be as strong. So I think that some of that will be reviewed. I'm not saying that it will disappear entirely because underneath it, it's a sound principle and it's sufficient. But it just shows that when, when we have challenges, when there is a shock, it's very difficult to, uh, to uphold. We also see that there is a, an increased ask to build in flexibility to quickly shift source, sourcing. We are seeing that some of our major customers are looking for more suppliers. So we've seen it on the pandemic. China locks down, production moves to, to Vietnam. Then Vietnam is in a complete lockdown for a month or two. Uh, 
production moves back to China or goes down to, uh, to Indonesia. So it's a question of working and customers in, um, around the world are looking for more flexibility. And it is probably also, as Domi said, about building in some additional redundancies in, in this. We need buffers of some sort into the whole system. Otherwise, we can't be that shock absorber that we actually are looking for. Uh, we need digital solutions and so on, but it's also about the physical capacities in the global infrastructure, as well as that building of, um, uh, of, um, of flexibility and, 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 uh, and buffers. We see there's a lot of talks about, does this lead to reshoring? I don't necessarily think so. It, if we build in the flexibility in the global supply chain, we can continue to enjoy the benefits from that global trade that has uh, honestly helped so many. But what I do see and what we do see is that a number of bigger customers around the world, they're looking to almost like ship their goods closer to their final use. So when you have multinational companies that are active all over Europe, as an example, they want to wait as long as they possibly can to decide whether the container in this case goes to Italy or it goes to the UK. So that the more we can build together with, uh, with those shippers, then uh, uh, it will basically give them that, um, I'm going to say that flexibility. We also see increasing ask for full end-to-end -end solutions so that they work with one logistics supplier, basically all the way from the production at the factory, in some cases, even out to the delivery to the, uh, to the store. And more and more customers are looking for, you can say, alternative and combined packages. They want to be able to move some of their stuff by ship, some of it by rail, some of it by air, and then depending on the needs, be able to shift around. The director general in the beginning spoke uh, about the vaccine and the vaccine distributions. That clearly showed the importance of air freight. It may not, you can say in the current, be the most CO2 friendly way of moving goods, but when you have certain situations, you need to be able uh, to adapt uh, to them. So, so, so that end-to-end -end packages is really what is being asked more and more for, and it's coming back into the whole thing about the resilience that you can actually shift around when there is a need. Uh, two more points that I want to make that we have seen as an outcome of the learnings uh, in the trade for the last, uh, last 12 months is the, uh, the increased need for digitized products. We want, the companies want to be able to, to work, see more people working from home. They need to have visibility to where is at all, uh, at all lanes, all links of the transportation, where is the goods, what can we do? Again, in order to get their, uh, I'm going to say their, their flexibility, how far are we in production of these goods? I need them faster, I need them slower to be able to basically move these things uh, around, reroute decisions. Okay, I built this for the US market. It has capability and adaptability to another market. So instead of shipping it to the US, I wanna ship it to this other country. Those kind of things is, is really where full uh, digital, inter digital integration and then also visibility is important. And then lastly, what we're seeing from many customers is, that we're looking at longer term agreements. I think more and more companies have come to realize that to get to that resilience, it is super important that they actually have agreements on their logistics that goes beyond a 12, six or 12 months horizon. So frame agreements that is in there in multi years and then really start to work on the problems on creating that resilience on all the other points that, um, that I have mentioned. So I think in conclusion on this here, I would certainly agree uh, to the points made that um, you can say protectionism and so on is not the solution. There is complications and there is risks with international trade, but I'm also convinced that by working together, the governments, the uh, logistics uh, suppliers, and then also the end customers, we can actually build some of that, uh, uh, I'm gonna say resilience in that this report is talking about. But, but there, is, there is no doubt that in a number of cases and for a number of areas in the world, we need to rethink how we do international uh, logistics. So that would be my 10 cents uh, into, into, into this uh, uh, topic. Thank you very much, Lars Michael. So um, the current shock has, I guess, revealed what, um, that, that the previous system, that, well, the existing system, for logistics um, and the movement of goods um, was well tuned to a particular set of uh, global circumstances and that the, the shock has revealed that there were limits uh, 
um, in that system and its ability to adjust and to uh, to uh, flex into these new demands. Well, the new new demands from the shocks, but also those shocks are, are teaching companies that um, they want to redesign their arrangements in the transportation sector, maybe uh, advancing uh, more quickly their desires to um, to build more flexible end-to-end -end supply um, and logistics uh, into their system. So thank you very much for that. We'll come back uh, with more questions during the Q&A. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Mami Mitsutori. She's Assistant Secretary General and Special Representative of the Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction, United Nations Office of Dis Disaster Risk Reduction. Uh, previously, she was Executive Director of the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures at the University of East Anglia in the United Kingdom. She also served for 27 years in the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs in various capacities. Um, your role right now is probably very stressful. Um, you see multiple disasters, you see climate change, you see um, uh, geopolitical unrest, you see COVID. So um, hearing from an international organization and your views on this would be very helpful. So please, Mami, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, um, Robert, and um, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Well, you know, my um, distinguished fellow panelists um, already have mentioned a lot, especially from the business point of view. Um, and if I can bring uh, a bit from the point of view of the UN system and um, as um, introduced, um, because I'm heading an organization um, in charge of disaster risk reduction, um, probably I can bring, uh, if not 10, five cents um, uh, to the conversation from that point of view. So uh, first of all, uh, congratulations. And I concur with um, Dr. Milner that um, this, this report is very timely, uh, focusing on resilience. Resilience um, was uh, the buzzword um, ever since COVID started. It has been the buzzword since this, um, during this whole year. And I believe that during the recovery from COVID, we always talk about resilient recovery. So it will remain to be um, the buzzword. But it's interesting that um, the, um, uh, authors of the um, report were saying that there is no clear definition of what is economic resilience at this time. So um, that is, I believe, is important. And that is one of the arguments that we, we make a lot. We talk about making things resilient, but because there is not a really clear measurement of what being resilient means, sometimes it is uh, difficult to invest in resilience. It is difficult to... Uh, to uh, center international cooperation around resilience. But the truth is that, again, as um, uh, my fellow panelists were saying, and also you, uh, Robert, that we are living in this um, extremely challenging time of uh, what we call multi-hazard era with the COVID-19 pandemic and COP26, both uh, really impacting on mm -hmm. trade, uh, trade routes, uh, costs and ways of trading um, being changed significantly by COVID-19. Uh, yes, uh, they have proved to be um, uh, somewhat flexible and didn't stop, as um, Mr. L Jensen mentioned, but they were affected. And um, as COP26 uh, is showing, um, there is uh, a major gap between what is needed in terms of uh, making trade uh, flexible, uh, but what governments are really willing to bind themselves uh, remains to be, there is a gap. Um, and I believe that you know at this time when we need to achieve the Paris climate goals, um, there is a, a significant requirement for change in the organization of global supply and value chains and in the composition and geography of trade flows. Um, trade policies and rules can incentivize the reduction of environmentally harmful practices. Uh, for example, by banning certain substances, checking the origin, prohibiting subsidies in certain sectors. Uh, trade rules and patents can also determine which innovations are shared among countries and how rapidly opening or closing the door to the adoption of green technologies uh, can happen. And in short, through trade regulations, regulations, international community, I believe, has an 
arsenal of powerful tools at its disposal to mitigate climate change and related disasters and improve the lives of billions of people. So uh, there is so much that a resilient trade can do, um, but um, are we heading towards that or not, I guess is the big question at this time of again, multi-hazard era, uh, because the relations also uh, can run the opposite way. And we know that trade is essential for lifting people, nations out of poverty, um, and this is, has been the truth since the beginning of time. And today, the trade balance in many livelihoods in developing countries depend on agricultural commodities that are highly vulnerable to climate change effects, make us you know, um, really think that, okay, um, uh, we do need to really focus on how um, these um, various disasters, but especially the climate-related disasters are affecting trade because um, during the past 20 years, 90% of all major um, disasters have been related to extreme weather events. So we do need to think about um, what is the central role of trade for the future of humanity and the increasing importance of building resilience for our future at this time when we just um, finished the COP26, which um, I believe which has mixed reviews. And so um, um, that is why we are really uh, grateful that WTO called on my organization in charge of disaster risk reduction to contribute to this report. And I hope that our contribution highlights how given the sharp increase in the frequency of disasters and also of the intensity of disasters and the economic damage that can be caused by many of these disasters, it's really important to embed risk prevention, reduction, and preparedness in everything, including trade. So, um, but um, again, is this, the, is this the reality or not is the big question. And talking about international cooperation, so we recently published a report on one of the seven global targets of the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. And that target is the one that calls for enhanced international cooperation with developing countries for disaster risk reduction. Now, the alarming or maybe not surprisingly um, alarming um, uh, result that came out from this report is that there is not much um, investment uh, when it comes to um, directing financing towards prevention. What I mean is that um, when it comes to disasters, most of the international cooperation goes into after the disaster, after the disaster has done its um, um, wreck, um, it goes into response, it goes into recovery, it goes, in, it goes into reconstruction. And of course, uh, reconstruction and recovery can be done in a way to build resilience. But of course, we all know, and there's a lot of uh, abundant evidence that says that if we invest more in prevention before a disaster comes, then we can uh, save much more in time of reconstruction. For example, uh, when it comes to infrastructure, World Bank several years ago published this very important report uh, called Lifeline, uh, which says that every dollar invested in making uh, infrastructure resilient will save up to $5 in uh, its lifetime uh, in terms of reconstruction and recovery. But uh, that's not uh, what we are doing yet. And as I mentioned, most of the international cooperation which is related to disaster goes into response and recovery. And we need to change this rapidly. And we believe that trade policy is an important tool to make the change. So for example, expanding and diversifying wholesale and retail trade networks, building economic strength by diversifying export markets, negotiating contingency contracts with transport firms and implementing disaster response planning exercises. These can all uh, contribute to build long-term resilience. And so uh, what I'm trying to say here is that trade policy can really play a central role um, in uh, building resilience into the economy, into the society. And I think that's exactly what this uh, report is telling us. So um, I believe that, you know, there's much that this uh, report uh, can contribute 
in the global um, uh, debate around uh, how should we understand the current risks that surround us? How can we build resilience? And importantly, when we know that the countries um, that are disproportionately hit by the disasters are the least developed countries, the SIDS, the landlocked developing countries, and the most vulnerable people who are living in these places. And in terms of economies, the ones that are most hit in the economy are the small and um, uh, medium-sized economies, um, enterprises. Uh, we need to find ways to build resilience uh, while paying special attention and enhancing international cooperation to these countries and these people. And uh, again, you know, I'd like to finish by saying that really we should um, improve the global trade rules and policies so that there is conducive, um, there, that they are conducive to growth, which is fair and sustainable for our planet and leaving no one behind. So I'll stop here and um, back to you, Robert. Thank you very much, Pammy. And uh, let me uh, acknowledge the importance of your, your uh, unit's contribution to our understanding of resilience. Uh, the work that you did and the contribution to the report was very, very helpful. And I remember early on, we had a seminar um, where your team's presentation was, uh, was very critical and very helpful. Let me, um, um, let me ask a, a broad question here to each of the three panelists, and then maybe we'll turn to questions if we have some coming in from the, from the stream. Um, so, uh, Mami, you mentioned that financing is mainly for recovery and not for preparation. Um, one of the things that we've observed, I think, generally over time, is that politics often has a very short-term focus, right? Um, but problems often need longer-term solutions. We also, I think, observe generally, not always, but generally that um, uh, people are often resistant to change. So voters um, uh, are often resistant to major changes, um, even in their daily routines. So switching from uh, a, a gas-powered car to an electric bicycle, uh, and if that means building bike lanes on roads that reduce the number of lanes and increases traffic, often even though the long-term benefits of that kind of decision-making can be very positive for the community and society overall, um, voters are very unhappy about things like that. Um, or often very unhappy. So can you guys, uh, each of you, uh, and let's go, um, we'll start with Lars Michael, then go to Stormy and then to Mami. Uh, any thoughts that you have on this from your business perspective? Lars Michael, you have to deal with politics in many different countries. Um, it creates a regulatory environment that you have to operate in. Uh, do you observe the kinds of challenges that Mami was talking, talking about? There is no doubt that you can say there are different approaches to different shocks. And uh, that makes it super difficult to navigate in this. And, and I think in many cases, it also brings, uh, I'm going to say, some restrictions into actually promoting, uh, to promoting the trade. When, uh, when Corona hit, uh, it, was, uh, it was handled in many different ways across the world. Of course, there are different impacts, but some of the rules ought to be the same. You know, there was no... There was no good international sort of like framework for how do you get seafarers on and off ships, right? So you ended up in a, I want to say in a, in a, I want to say in a very, very uh, unhappy situation for many seafarers that couldn't get on or off the ships or anything. And yet they were the ones that actually kept the world wheels uh, spinning here. So, so things like that, I can, I can really see uh, is there. But, but I also agree on the point about, you can say the investment that needs to be done uh, in, between, in between the shocks because the current shock that we have is also about lack of investments in infrastructure in certain parts of the world. Uh, um, how, do we, how do we attract, this is also policy, I guess, because you know, where do you make greenfield projects for, for, for new terminals and ports and so on, which is kind of like a super important part for international trade. And also, and also, how do you make it, this is maybe a very down-to-earth thing, but how do you make it attractive to actually work as a trucker? Because a lot of the goods that we ship around the world, they don't just need to be moved by ship. They also need to go from the terminal and into an inland location. Uh, 
And if you are missing 100,000 truckers in, a, in, a, in the UK or whatever the number is, or half a million in Europe and so on, that is actually, you can say, the infrastructure that is missing. And maybe when we talk about investments and aligned policies, maybe we need to look at some of those things as well. Thank you, Lars Michael. Uh, very interesting bringing in the trucker thing makes you wonder uh, how well are labor markets working if there is such a shortage of, of uh, needed skills uh, for something that doesn't require a whole lot of preparation to join that, uh, that labor market. Um, Stormy, please. Yeah, I want to underline how important it is um, to do investment. Um, and um, this is something which we underlined in, in the Cornwall consensus, which we put forward um, in our, um, uh, of our economic resilience, G7 economic resilience uh, panel. Um, and it's investment um, in soft infrastructure, it's investment in hard infrastructure, but it's really, really investment in people, in people and education. Um, and um, the G7 agreed um, on more investment. Uh, the G7 also agreed on an infrastructure initiative. Um, and I think this is something where we really need to see some, some quick action. Um, I also wanted to add a couple of other points, though. Um, what I observed um, in the in the early month of the um, of the pandemic was that we did have a lot of silo approaches, so to say, um, between countries, but also within countries. Um, so we had. At least in my country, the Ministry of Health, which uh, pursued its, uh, its its strategy. Then we had the Ministry of Economics, we um, uh, the Ministry of, of of Labor, and you know in Germany we have a very strong resort principle. Every ministry um, has has a lot of power in itself. Um, and um, the inter I, I I felt that sometimes the interconnections um, were lost. And in in um, in a time where we face multiple interacting and self um, and, 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 and crisis, which are um, uh, intensifying each other, we, we can't afford to have such a silo approach. And we need to, we need to have different and new mechanisms um, for dealing with those um, new sorts and kinds of crisis. Um, the second one I wanted to add because of um, what you mentioned, political in, in activity and, and justifying the cost of investment. I think we need to put a price at not acting at not investing, at, at not dealing with our vulnerabilities. Uh, and that's why I mentioned um, in the beginning of my comments that some risks are really unknown, but a lot of risks are really known. Um, so to say, these are the known un unknowns. Um, we, we decide not to act on them. And one of the examples, uh, power lines in the United States, um, the big uh, the big winter storm in Texas, everything broke down. This was not unexpected, right? Um, there was a, a decision not to act, but if we put a price on inaction, maybe it becomes easier to, to act. Um, and last point I wanted to, to add, and that brings me back to the international cooperation, and that is uh, trusting in trusting each other. I think we will not um, <laughs> um, reduce our vulnerabilities if we don't do stress testing together. And if we don't do crisis scenario exercises together, and if we are not willing to talk about our vulnerabilities between countries in safe spaces, for example, G7 or G20. But there is a lot of mistrust still. And in the end, we see each other as competitors. We don't want to share the data, but that is a huge impediment, I think, to increase resilience. So um, I think we need to do more exercises to build trust um, among those who make the decisions. Thank you, Stormy. Very interesting point about price on not acting also, I think. Um, it's, it's very useful to make sure that that information is uh, generated and available and taken seriously. I think sometimes it's uh, when it is generated, it's often dismissed. Mami, do you have uh, an intervention you'd like to add on this? Yeah, thank you. Um, so um, it's true, isn't it? The short term is then both at the government level and the private sector is a problem and politicians usually do not, uh, are not good at looking beyond their election cycle. And that is where the voters kick in. And I think that's why you know, we see a surge of um, support for uh, green parties around the world. But at the same time, um, we're not still sure whether that is what the majority of voters are asking for. And um, when you look at um, 
I think the proof of the pudding will be in the recovery from COVID because we know that trillions of dollars are being you know, used for economic stimulus. This is really going to be a stimulus that will be resilient as we say, green as we um, ask for. I think that's, that's the big question. In terms of investment, um, uh, the financial sector, um, thanks to people like Mark Carney, I think there's much more done now um, in terms of disclosing climate risk. Uh, which does help um, direct money to the right um, uh, areas, building resilience. But risk is much more than the future climate risk. It's also about the vulnerability in our society. So that's why um, we are advocating that there should be a more wider, a more uh, broader disclosure of risk, on, including not only future uh, climate risk, but also in terms of the current and past vulnerability of societies and bring that all together um, and make it a, um, a mandatory disclosure um, for um, financial sector. And that I think will make a big risk um, um, difference. The last point I would like to make, which is connected to what um, um, Stormy mentioned, is about um, what we call the systemic nature of risk. What we're seeing is that because of the interconnectivity of everything, the risk that we um, are seeing is called the systemic risk. And this is about really one thing leading to another, as we saw in COVID. But our, our risk, again, as Tony said, our solution is not systemic, it's siloed. We need a, a systemic, a structural approach to risk when the risk is systemic, but that's not happening. And it's about all of sector um, approach, whole of society approach, not only horizontally, but also vertically. Uh, connecting the national governments to the local governments to the communities and that's not I think what we have achieved yet but I think COVID is telling us that unless we get there we really won't have a solution to the risk we are facing. Thank you Mami. Um, one thing for sure is uh, trust and as we approach uh, the WTO's uh, 12th ministerial conference um, we certainly want to encourage member countries um, or member economies to uh, build that kind of trust and find ways to reach compromise and take uh, rulemaking forward to help stabilize global trade. So, um, you know, we have that coming up in a, a couple of weeks and um, it's very interesting to see the negotiations uh, underway and uh, the strong views about uh, particular positions. Um, and I guess the need is, can we find ways to compromise where there's net gains for society, even if uh, there's some some uh, need to shift in positions. Uh, now, let me ask my colleagues, uh, Eddie and Jose, if they would like to comment or weigh in on what they've heard. Yeah, I, I would merely like to, to ask a question um, because I think there is a topic that uh, may be propped up in the, in the last months and so we, we couldn't properly address it um, in, the, in the report. And that is the, the whole discussion about the, the, the value chain disruptions in the, in the recent months and the, the value chain bottlenecks. And I wondered what your, what your view is on this, because you could on the one hand say, OK, this actually shows that trade uh, constitutes a vulnerability and that if we, if we have say COVID like pandemic related uh, closures of harbors or well, not closures, but interruptions that there are that there are problems appearing. But on the other hand, you can also say trade has actually contributed um, a lot to um, to spreading the benefits of, of large fiscal stimulus in, in mainly the rich countries. And the question I would then also like to ask is what 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 would have happened um, and partially that provides an answer, what would have happened if, um, if say, the US were, were a much more closed economy and Europe were much more closed? Like, uh, what kind of, of um, uh, shortages and bottlenecks would we have seen in that case? And is it, maybe, is it maybe the case that trade in this case, although there are, of course, interruptions in, 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 in harbors and in, in, in value chains, uh, on the other hand, trade actually also provides a solution to to spread out these shocks. So I, I wondered whether you have whether you have some views on this. And and yeah, to mention again, I, I bring this topic in because we unfortunately we weren't able to to go into this uh, into this issue that propped up in the in the last months. Does anybody want to take that on? <laughs> 
I mean, given the uh, given the bottlenecks, probably first and foremost come into my territory. Let me have a go at it first. Uh, I think the thing to remember in this year is also that the international trade is actually one of the foundations for the steps forward that we have done as a society, be that in the developed countries or in the developing countries. So, so I, it would have been a completely different world if um, if um, um, if we hadn't had that international trade. Uh, you can say the uh, the uh, the challenges that we've had on the value chain, on the bottlenecks, and so on, would not have happened because it would have been a different situation. On the other hand, you know, it would have been uh, let's say a different world to um, to live in. So I think we should more look at this year as a warning and as a learning that we need to build that resilience in order to keep that how can I say that progress going. Because the international trade is bringing, you can say, value to all the countries. It's not just the question of some countries getting part of the value and the others not. Because the exporting countries get value and economic growth from it, and as well as the, the importing countries. So I'd rather turn it around and say, okay, we, 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 we've gotten a, a, a strong warning. How do we then build around that on all the points that we talked about in, in making the trade simpler to, uh, to progress in maybe... In some cases, over investing in the education, in the infrastructures, and so on, so that we have a bit of buffer to uh, to run with. For me, it's a warning that you say efficiency is good, but over efficiency opens for risk. So you talk a lot about the trade bringing risks, and there I would say when the supply chain has become so efficient that even the smallest bump on the road can create, uh, on the say, some disturbance, then it's probably become too efficient, and that's. And that's that extra buffer redundancies, whatever we call it, that we then all collectively need uh, to build um, to build back uh, into this year. So I wouldn't go into the protections mode on this year. We shouldn't be scared of the current situation and then and then run back doing that. We should we should learn from the challenges that we've had, and it's everything from education to infrastructure investments to alignment of global rules. Uh, simplifying using uh, you can say digital solutions and stuff like that that's the way forward the other thing is uh, is a step backwards in my, in my opinion so let's not be afraid because of what we see let's learn from what we see I also Thank you, Lars Michael Stormy yes please <laughs> just 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 add a couple of sentences I think we need to um, take a very close look at where the vulnerabilities come from and why we have them, um, to then also target them with specific fitting policies. And, and one of the issues, um, which I think we haven't talked about um, uh, a whole lot yet, uh, at least not in, in this panel, is market distortions um, being caused by government policies. Um, and also in the trade uh, sphere. Um, and that's why I think it is also important that we talk about rules um, and uh, competition rules, for example, um, over capacities, um, that we do talk about export controls and some of the other distorting um, measures, um, because I very much agree some, some risks are um, natural, some are technological, some are socioeconomic, but some are also caused by governments themselves, um, creating market distortions. And, and that is hard for companies to address, right? This is where really um, the governments and international organizations uh, come in. And I do have great hope for MC12 on that too. <laughs> Thank you, Stormy. Mami, you, would you like the last word? Uh, I think, you know, um, the vulnerability issue is a big one, isn't it? Um, of course, you know, um, um, and we do need to understand where the vulnerability is. Um, and that is in the case of um, all uh, disaster risk reduction um, um, methodology. If we don't understand where it is, then we really can't have a um, comprehensive risk management policy. And I also agree with uh, Mr. Uh, Jensen that it's it's really all about learning and you know improving um, and reducing the vulnerability. And uh, overall, I believe that um, trade has really um, saved us right because if the trade um, is not as we as it has been um, um, established then uh, we would have been a much um, more um, difficult time so um, that's um, that's for sure 
But uh, my last word uh, from the UN perspective is that um, we do have the um, system, but do we have the political will of solidarity? Like the director general was mentioning, it is a, a really pitiful um, um, place where we are in terms of the vaccination rollout and whatnot. So um, yes, so we do have the system and we can improve, improve, it, improve it. But again, if we don't have the political will, and uh, if we don't have the solidarity, then uh, no system can really um, save us. Thank you, Mami. Well, I'd like to thank you all for joining us um, and very much appreciated the panel's insights and the participation from you, uh, those of you online. Thank you once again to Eddie and Jose for their excellent work in uh, coordinating the report and presenting it. And uh, I wish you all a good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.